Federalist number 83, the judiciary continued in relation to the trial by jury by Alexander Hamilton. The objection of the plan of the convention, which has met with most success in this state and perhaps in several of the other states, is that relat relative to the want of a constitutional provision for the trial by jury in civil cases, a disingenuous form in which this objection is usually stated has been repeatedly adverted to and exposed, but continues to be pursued in all the conversations and writings of the opponents of the plan. The mere silence of the Constitution in regard to civil causes is represented as an abolition of the trial by jury and the declamations to which it has afforded a pretext are artfully calculated to induce a persuasion that this pretended abolition is complete and universal. Extending not only to every species of civil, but even to criminal causes. To argue with respect to the latter would, however, be as vain and fruitless as to attempt the serious proof of the existence of matter, or to demonstrate any of those pr propositions which, by their own internal evidence, force conviction when expressed in language adapted to convey their meaning. With regard to civil causes, subtleties almost too contemptible for refutation have been adopted to countenance the surmise that a thing which is only not provided for is entirely abolished. Every man of discernment must at once perceive the wide difference between silence and abolition. But as the inventors of this fallacy have attempted to support it by le certain legal maxims of interpretation which they have perverted from their true meaning, it may not be wholly useless to explore the ground they have taken. And the maxims on which they rely are of this nature. A specification of particulars and an ex is an exclusion of generals, or the expression of one thing is the exclusion of another. Hence, say they, as the Constitution has established a trial by jury in criminal cases and is silent in respect to civil, this silence is an implied prohibition of trial by jury in regard to the latter. The rules of legal interpretation are rules of common sense, adapt, adapt, adopted by the courts in the construction of the laws. The true test, therefore, of a just application of them is its conformity to the source from which they are derived. This being the case, let me ask if it is consistent with reason or common sense to suppose that provision obliging the legislative power to commit the trial of criminal causes to juries is a privation of its right to authorize or permit that mode of trial in other cases. It is natural to suppose that a command to do one thing is a prohibition on the doing of another, which there was a previous power to do, and which is not incompatible with the thing commanded to be done. If such a supposition would be unnatural and unreasonable, it cannot be rational to maintain that an injunction of the trial by jury is in certain cases is an interdiction of it in others. The power to constitute courts is a power to prescribe the mode of trial, and consequently, if nothing was said in the Constitution on the subject of juries, the legislature would be at liberty either to adopt an institution or to let it alone. This direction in regard to criminal causes is abridged by the express injunction of a trial by jury in all such cases, but it is, of course, left at large in relation to civil causes there being a total silence on this head. The specification of an obligation to try all criminal causes in a particular mode excludes indeed the obligation or necessity of employing the same mode in civil causes, but does not abridge the power of the legislature to exercise that mode if it should be thought proper. The pretense, therefore, that the national legislature would be at full liberty to submit all the civil causes of federal cognizance to the determination of juries is a pretense destitute of all just foundation. From these observations, this conclusion results that the trial by jury in civil cases would not be abolished and that the use attempted to be made of the maxims which have been quoted is contrary to reason and common sense and therefore not admissible. Even if these maxims had a pretense, had a precise technical sense corresponding with the ideas of those who employ them upon the present occasion, which however is not the case, they would still be incompatible with the constitution of government. In relation to such a subject, the natural and obvious sense of its provisions, apart from any technical rules, is the true criterion of construction. Having now seen that the maxims relied upon will not bear the use made of them, let us endeavor to ascertain their proper use and true meaning. This will be best done by examples. The plan of the convention declares that the power of Congress 
or in other words, of the national legislature shall extend to certain enumerated cases. This specification of particulars evidently excludes all pretension to a general legislative authority because an affirmative grant of special powers would be absurd as well as useless if a general authority was intended. In like manner, the judiciary authority of the federal judiciary, judiciators is declared by the Constitution as compar to comprehend certain cases particularly specified. The expression of those cases marks the precise limits beyond which the federal courts cannot extend their jurisdiction because the, uh, the objects of their cognizance being enumerated. The specification would be nugatory if it did not exclude all ideas of more extensive authority. These examples might be sufficient to elucidate the maxims which have been mentioned and to designate the manner in which they should be used. But that there may be no possibility of misapprehension upon this subject, I shall add one case more to demonstrate the proper use of these maxims and the abuse which has been made of them. Let us suppose that by the laws of this state, a married woman was incapable of conveying her estate, and that the legislature, considering this an evil, should enact that she might dispose of her property by deed executed upon the presence of a magistrate. In such a case, there can be no doubt that the specification would amount to an exclusion of any other mode of conveyance, because the woman having no previous power to alienate her property, the specification determines the particular mode which she is for that purpose to avail herself of. But let us further suppose that in a subsequent part of the same act, it should be declared that no woman should dispose of any estate of a determinate value without the consent of three of her nearest relations signified by their signing the deed. Could it be inferred from this regulation that a married woman might not procure the approbation of their relations to a deed for conveying property of inferior value? The position is too absurd to merit a refutation, and yet this is precisely the position which those must establish who contend that the trial by juries in civil cases is abolished because it is expressly provided for in cases of criminal nature. In these observations, it must appear unquestionably true that a trial by jury is in no case abolished by the proposed Constitution. It is equally true that in those controversies between individuals in which the great body of the people are likely to be interested, that institution will remain precisely in the same situation in which it is placed by the state constitutions and will be in no degree altered or influenced by the adoption of the plan under consideration. The foundation of this assertion is that the national judiciary would have no cognizance of them, and of course they will retain, remain determinable as heretofore by the state courts only, and in the manner which the state constitutions and laws prescribe. All land causes, except where claims under the grants of different states come into question, and all other controversies between the citizens of the same state, unless where they depend upon positive violations of the Articles of Union by acts of the state legislatures, will belong exclusively to the jurisdiction of the state tribunals. Add this to that admiralty causes, and almost all those which are of equity jurisdiction are determinable under our own government without the intervention of a jury, and the inference from the whole will be that this institution, as it exists with us at present, cannot possibly be affected to any great extent by the proposed alteration in our system of government. The friends and adversaries of the plan of the convention, if they agree on nothing else, concur at least in the value they set upon the trial by jury, or if there is any difference between them, it consists in this. The former regard it as a valuable safeguard to liberty, the latter represent it as a very palladium of free government. For my own part, the more the operation of the institution has fallen under my observation, the more reason I have discovered for holding it in high estimation, and it would be altogether superfluous to examine to what extent it deserves to be esteemed useful or essential in a representative republic, or how much more merit it may be entitled to as a defense against the oppressions of an hereditary monarch than as a barrier to the tyranny of popular magistrates and a popular government. Discussions of this kind would be more curious than beneficial as all are satisfied with the utility of the institution and of its friendly aspect to liberty. But I must acknowledge that I cannot rightly discern the inseparable connection between the existence of liberty and the trial by jury in civil cases. Arbitrary impeachments, arbitrary methods of prosecuting pretended offenses, and arbitrary punishments upon arbitrary convictions have ever appeared to me to be great engines of judicial despotism. And these have all relation to criminal proceedings. 
The trial by jury in a criminal case is aided by the Habeas Corpus Act seem therefore to be alone in concern in the question, and both of these are provided for in the most ample manner in the plan of the convention. It has been observed that trial by jury is a safeguard against an oppressive exercise of the power of taxation. This observation de deserves to be canvassed. It is evident that it can have no influence upon the legislature in regards to the amount of taxes to be laid.